Hello, I'm Anna Raimondi, coming to you from the Angel Cooperative in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Welcome to this episode of Talking to the Dead and Suburbia. I am so happy to welcome my guest today, Denise Lamoureux. She is such a kind, pure, compassionate spirit. I hope that you will feel that as you listen to this podcast. Denise was the founder of Finding Feathers Wellness Center in Fairfield, Connecticut. Denise combined her education and knowledge in both Western and Eastern medicine to create the Colette Technique and for core trauma healing. The Colette Techniques helps people find freedom from long-term illness, including anxiety, addiction, suicidal thoughts, cutting, weight gain or loss, autoimmune system illness, physical problems, and low self-esteem. That's a lot of things that it addresses. Having found extraordinary results in her practice as a healer, she is now an inspirational speaker and teacher. So welcome, Denise. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. You know, these days and age, you know, we're dealing with so much trauma, you know, whether it's, you know, national trauma, global trauma, which all translates into personal trauma. And I firmly believe that every single person has PTSD, whether it's this small or this big, you know, um, it's how we deal with it. But, you know, for the sake of just a definition, can you explain what trauma is? Sure, absolutely. And I agree with you. I think everybody's got some form of PTSD. And, you know, people think when we look at the word trauma, oh, it's got to be abuse or it's got to be addiction and, and childhood uh, sexual abuse or anything like that. It isn't. Trauma can often be what didn't happen also. Two, two parents can be out there working full time and the, the child can come home uh, to an empty house being a latchkey kid. He can feel lonely. He can feel abandoned. He can feel like he doesn't matter. The point of trauma is not what happened. It's how did it make me feel inside? Right. So when you look at trauma in the brain where it sits in the unconscious, remembering that the unconscious is going to record everything, if it doesn't get to get processed, then it's trauma. So let's say I just started to scream at you and you wanted to have a scream back at me because of such bad manners, but you wouldn't do that because you're hosting this show. You'd keep it inside. Right. If you never got it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> We've known each other for a bit. But if you never got a chance to get it out as a kid, then it's going to stay stuck. It's going to stay stuck. So a reaction happens in the brain. Oh my gosh, this isn't good. Oh my gosh, this isn't safe. Oh my gosh, I'm scared. But it doesn't come out. And it builds up enough that it represses into the unconscious brain. And we bring that all those experiences, all those crushed emotions, all those push down things into adulthood. And that's how we behave and that's how we react and that's how we have relationships from those old beliefs. From Not those only does it affect us psychologically, but very often I'll be with someone and I feel constriction in the throat. So aesthetically, you know, which to me means you're not speaking, you're not speaking your truth. There's a fear of getting it out, you know, so it happens on all levels of our being. So it's just not a psychological and psychological and energetic does lead to physical problems as well. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, it absolutely does. And I'll tell you why, because first of all, when you suppress, depress or repress an emotion a memory and experience and a belief, especially as a child, you'll do that for the reason of survival, right? It's too overwhelming, the neurobiological system of the child to do it. Harvard had came out in 2012 with a study that said the coping mechanisms and the coping skills that we put in place as children for survival were necessary then, but are detrimental to the physical, emotional, and relationship health of the adult. Why is it detrimental to the physical? When you suppress and repress these memories, we see scientifically you're suppressing and depressing the immune system. And so there's some great books out, When the Body Says No, When the Body Keeps Score. Louise Hay would say everything about the physical body ailment. Trauma gets stuck in the body. That's one of the things about my work. You're right on the throat, the inability to speak, but the throat will also, the neck will also hold, I've got to control everything and I've got to keep myself safe. So you'll find that in there, but yeah, bad knees, everything, everything in physical ailments. COVID, right? COVID affects a weakened immune system. 
with today's society and the stress levels that it's in, everybody trying to work, people out of jobs, uh, people scared of what's gonna happen, people wearing masks, nobody hugging. Imagine the immune system getting even weaker and weaker and weaker. Yeah. So you developed a technique called the Colette technique. Can you explain to my listeners? So in, in Western background, I am a child of trauma and I spent years trying to get better, trying to feel better. And way back then, you know, we didn't have healers and we didn't talk about this kind of stuff. And I was very successful and everything looked great on the outside, but inside I suffered with things anxiety. I became an alcoholic. I, uh, you know, always had issues with weight and relationships and I couldn't find anything that could help me. So I created this technique where we override the conscious brain. So generally, if you're really ready for a healing, you're really ready to change. Your unconscious is now up. It's ready to release this stuff. So this technique helps us to override, take the client back into a state of neuro relaxation, if you will. And we can literally take the client back to memories that they completely forgot about. Experiences that they never even saw or random memories that they had that they don't understand the reason. And when you take the adult back there, the adult person back there, she can see that the experience did happen, but it happened differently than she saw it. It wasn't because of her. Like her father didn't hate her her mother actually was just hospitalized and the father was scared to death that he was gonna be left alone with a four-year-old, right? That changes that whole core belief of I'm not lovable, I'm not good enough, my, I don't matter, right? So we go back and do the healing in the actual experience and what we do is reprogram it, rewire it. And it literally makes a new synoptic connection in the brain. And it literally, Anna, it does it in one session. It changes things that quickly. And then all of a sudden you go to find that anger and rage that you're so used to using as your coping skill, as your defense, and you, it's gone. You don't have it. And so then you have to put in new coping skills, right? How do I then react to that? And what's the next higher vibration drive after anger? courage, contentment, love, happy, joy. And those things begin to get put in place. And we start to have compassion, not only for the other people, but most importantly, we learn to start to have compassion for ourselves. Because I don't think it's not only for the person you're working with, because I feel like it clears ancestral, you know, mm -hmm. trauma. And not only that, it ends it going forward. So it clears out present, past, and future. And, you know, and that's really important because that's what we want to do to not only heal ourselves, but to, you know, to heal those who are past, but to heal our families and our children. And not only those, but also the people around us who pick this up around us. Oh yeah, I agree. I remember one time way back in, I don't know, being in an ashram somewhere or something. And one of the gurus was telling me that if I didn't heal this stuff, I would have to come back in another lifetime and heal it again. And I thought, oh no, 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 no. I don't want to do that. A lot. <laughs> People saying, oh no, I'm not doing this. Well, right. And then I remember uh, somebody teaching me that when you heal this from yourself, you heal this from your children. And I see that completely in my experience with my kids, completely, absolutely. And then we heal their grandkids and our grand that yeah. next generation and the generation after that. Trauma is definitely, I'll tell you a really quick way to show how uh, trauma passes down in the lineage. Long time, not too long ago, 10 years ago, they did an experiment with baby mice. It wasn't on trauma, it was on something else, but this point's the same. And they shocked, I'm sorry, adult mice. They shocked the adult mice every time they smelled cherry blossoms. Okay, so then the adult mice associated cherry blossoms with pain. The generations after that associated cherry blossoms with pain. She wasn't pregnant that at the time, right? So that's literally how it passes down. It's extraordinary stuff. Yeah, that's why there's being more and more work done with our energy because you know it's it's not just what's coded in our blood. You know, it goes further further than that. I, you know, this is all very fascinating, and it's very cutting edge. You know, because I feel like our children or our grandchildren are going to live in a world where this is not something that needs to be explained, but is conventional. 
So it's very exciting to think that we're bringing this forward to them and you're bringing this forward to them in a way that is easy to understand. Um, and also you're showing like this works. Let me show you how this works. You know, and you know, in addition to all of this personal stuff, we're in a pandemic right now, you know, and they, they're saying that the next pandemic is the mental health crisis, you know, when we come out of COVID. So, you know, collectively, you know, how do you feel that, you know, how COVID is affecting all of us? Yeah, well, I agree with you completely. You know, already in, in my world or in my experience, you know, I, I the COVID deaths are over 400,000 and I completely understand that and have great sympathy for that. But the suicide rate is also up 400% mm -hmm. from the ages of 10, mm -hmm. 34, 10, right? So an isolation, addictions are absolutely on the rise because what do addicts love to do? Well, we love to isolate because then we can use our drugs or our drinking or whatever. And when I talk about addiction, I wanna be clear that it's not just alcohol and drugs, it's money, it's shopping, it's codependency, it's food. But so yeah, when we come out of this, what are we gonna be doing in the mental health side of things? One thing that I've seen that I've really loved a lot of is that I've seen so many more meditation apps so many more meditations available. You know, I often will do an eight week free healing clinic on Zoom. I'm seeing other people do that. Uh, so I'm hoping that people like myself and yourself will have the opportunity to be here. And I think if I could say anything that I think is so important to anybody out there that's gonna come out of this with mental health issues, isolation, loneliness issues, addiction issues, speak up. Speak up, find anybody you can and speak up, hold their hand, reach out to Anna, reach out to me, reach out to anybody that you know in the field, because that's how we help people through it. Silence is never going to heal. No, you know, it's interesting because um, I've also seen going through this that, you know, medical doctors are, since they've had a little bit of time, are sitting back and saying, how does this alternative and, con and conventional work? So I'm actually writing a book with um, Dr. Annie Sim, who is a Yale and board certified psychiatrist on suicide. Very cool. Ah, oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. And so that kind of was born out of, you know, spirit. Um, Spirit brought us together, um, and we are excited about putting this forward um, and having people be able to heal through it, you know, mm -hmm. recognizing the medical aspects of it, the psychological aspects, and what happens, you know, um, spiritually, energetically after it, you know, mm -hmm. so all of that is, is really important, and mental health issues have been a problem you know, and just looking at the US, okay, that, you know, have kind of a little bit been addressed, but not as big as it should have. So, you know, sometimes bad, good, who knows, you know, now it's bringing, it's boiling, it's boiling. And so we have to pay attention to it. So whether you're doing it conventionally or, you know, with, you know, people are coming to you for this, you know, I think it's, um, it's absolutely, it's absolutely wonderful. But, you know, how are we going to help our children, these kids, you know, the children of this country, you know, they're going through all of this pain now and they're holding it. And there are a lot of them are old old souls so you know what do you suggest around around this so what i would really like to see for the children of the world and, and certainly of america and you're right america has sort of pushed the mental health issue under the rug for so long but it would be great if we could start like a if every classroom even preschool could start like a social circle you know where the kids got together in circle and they whether they journaled or they painted whatever it is that they were feeling. Because again, if it's not stuck, it's not trauma. So if I can say as a three-year-old, I was really scared last night because daddy came home really drunk. It takes it out. There was very cool gentleman. I, can't, I wish I could remember his name. He's a teacher up in New Haven and he just did an inner city experiment a few months ago where he told the kids that they were gonna have a new teacher, but that she wanted to get them to know them before they got there. So we had them every day write letters to her. 
I think these were fourth graders. So every day they're writing these letters. Now, every day they're writing letters, they're feeling like they're getting to know the teacher more and more. So they're talking about the fight mommy and daddy had. They're talking about the fact that they feel abandoned. They're saying there was violence and hitting. And so it's giving the teachers an opportunity to talk to the children, but it's giving the teachers an opportunity, the guy who was running it, to bring those letters to the parents and say to the parents, hey, this is what your kid is feeling before Department of Child Service has to come in, right? Do you want to fix this situation? Do you see that this is how your child is feeling? If not, there's other steps that are going to come down the road, which is how people lose their children, right? right. And the results were remarkable, remarkable. Parents were like, thank you so much. They really tried to change. Some parents separated, some parents got clean, some didn't change, but the majority of it was magnificent. And that's the kind of stuff. If we don't suppress it or repress it, suppress it's when we do it on purpose, right? I can't deal with this. I'll deal with this later. Repress it's when we do it unconsciously. I can't handle this. I'm a kid. I'm overwhelmed. If it doesn't get suppressed, it's not trauma. And I think a lot of the problems we have today is these kids do not connect with no. each other one-on-one. On, one on one. And, you know, as creatures of beings of this great love that is God, we were brought here to love each other. As human beings, we are social creatures. We were here, we're here to connect with each other, not on our phones or typing on our computers. You know, I watch it, you know, with, I've watched it with my sons, you know, there's the online dating and there's the texting and everything gets, you know, convoluted that way, you know, as opposed to, you know, when I was grow up, you locked eyes with somebody, you know, in a bar or at a party, you know, and you felt the energy coming from that person. Can't quite feel that you know, coming through, you know, cyberspace. So I think that is a problem as well that, you know, at some level as a society, we have to look at and find ways other than running on a field because there's no talking. You know, when I was growing up, you know, I was a, unbelievably, I know this is, but I was shy up until I was eight, um, you know, but I was very, I was always very a private person. And so I wouldn't tell my stuff, okay? But I remember my friends, like them unloading about families and stuff like that there was an outlet there's no outlet anymore yeah no and everybody's staring at their phone i mean the studies that we're going to find first of all ipad and phone are addiction absolutely the studies that we're going to find on isolation in 10 years from now after everybody on their phone and everybody on their ipads the way they are they don't oh. even communicate with voice anymore you know we all need time to ourselves we all need time to regroup you know, our lives should not be filled with outside chatter. Sometimes we need to go deep into ourselves, but we don't need to live there, you right. know? Um, and we have a lot of older people living there, younger people living there. And this destroys, I think, the fabric of not only society, but, you know, this journey of our lives where, you know, we're supposed to help because we're all healers, you know? You can't help yourself or somebody else if you're living in this place of disassociation you know mm -hmm. and that's and that's a problem um so you know you know trauma is dis is also disassociation that's one of the coping skills that harvard would talk about disassociation i'll separate because i can't i'm overwhelmed by everything so the brain will disassociate and then you'll start talking to me about something that maybe isn't, you're trying to give me some guidance, but I don't want to hear. I'll go right into that disassociation and I won't hear. And where will we go? We'll go right to our phone. Yeah. As, as we're talking about 17 year olds and 15 year olds and 20 year olds. You know what I'm talking well, about? You know what I find so interesting about you and your path? I mean, you are a child of alcoholics. Um, you were an alcoholic. And so, you know, you've had great trauma in your life. And so what you're bringing to the table is a connection to the people that come to you. You know, no matter, I mean, maybe I have a shopping addiction. I don't know, <laughs> you know, I don't know. 
I mean, I'm not spending billions of dollars, don't get me wrong. Um, but you know, like everybody has an outlet. Um, you know, it's what it's how far you take the outlet. Like it's okay to to drink, but when you're drinking at the extreme, you know, that's when it's problematic. If you're shopping and you're spending more money than you have in the bank that's a problem okay um you know so i feel like you bring to the table something that you know people can look at you and say you're not just talking this stuff like you get it you know well, i bring to the table whether i like it or not addiction i bring to the table depression i bring to the table anxiety i bring to the table loneliness i bring to the table suicidal thoughts i bring to the table single mom you know i bring to the table fear I bring to the table all those things, you know, that have, I have made me, I guess, the healer that I am. And I think that, yes, because of that, it gives me a great connection for people. I do think just to say on the shopping, and just like you said, you're absolutely right. People shouldn't fear too much that they're popping into addiction through this COVID time, because a lot of people are using escapes. Because if you look at the things, like you said, shopping isn't addictive, but it is for some, right? Cocaine and heroin is an addictive. It's actually made from the derivative of diamorphine. Morphine you get when you go and have surgery, right? But it's addictive to some. Alcohol is an addictive, but it is for some. Crystal meth was used as the first antidepressant in the 40s, right? So it's how, what, it's the escape. It's the escape from pain. It's the relief that we're looking for that we get from our addiction. Or to fill that void with love. Right. Oh, absolutely. That void gets filled with love when you feel like there's that emptiness, eating, you know, absolutely. shopping, drugs, alcohol, what sex, people are sex addicts, you know, um, you got to look at yourself and say, this is a problem, you know, because I can't, it's, it's taking, it's taking over me. It's defining me. And that's when it's a big deal. But, you know, all healers, we all have our stuff, you know, like, you know, like, I don't know, somebody on some social media said something about me and, and Mother Teresa. I Let me tell you guys, I am not Mother Teresa, okay? You know, no, I, I'm a human being. I have my faults. I've gone through my stuff. That's why I understand you. That's why she understands you. Um, you know, we're not perfect. We're as infallible as everybody else. But, you know, you're walking this path that says, let me take all of the stuff that I've grown from and let me bring it to the table to help other people. And I wish that, you know, people would, you know, step up and say, yeah, Denise, I, I do need some help here. You know, um, what website can they go to to learn more about you? It's denisecolette.com. So D-E-N-I-S-E-C-O-L-E-T-T-E.com. And one good thing that you can do on my website is just go directly to the video page because there's videos on addiction, there's videos on trauma, there's videos on relationships. They're all one to three minutes long. They're not, you know, but they're really going to give you a great education. You're really going to be able to say, oh, I understand what she's talking about. And like you were talking about with addiction, I always say it's not the addiction. It's the pain, not why the addiction, why the pain, heal the pain to heal the addiction. Mm -hmm. I just want to throw this in. So your father is, is sitting next to you. Okay. Uh, um, and so he never went through the healing process. Like he never, yeah, he never took responsibility is what he's saying. Okay. Now you chose your father. Okay. As you know, as, as a soul coming through. Um, and he wants you to say that he's saying that he's very proud, proud that you're taking everything that, you know, he did not address in life and you're moving it forward. Okay. Um, he wants you to write letters to him. Um, have you ever written letters to him? Um, I feel like um, he's saying, tell her to write the letters to me, okay? I, I write letters to God. I don't write them to him, okay? You have to write them to him. I also feel like they're, um, you're getting pushed, pushed more to dealing with um, parents, okay? You know, um, and this book that you've been trying to write because it's, it's never been really clear, I think the book is to parents. Okay. You know, I feel like, you know, um, you're healing the issues that have been pulled up, but I keep hearing she needs to start at the core. You need okay. to start with the children. 
you know, um, so whether they're, you know, just, I mean, listen, anything, you know, um, I do readings with kids, you know, you I've know, got a lot of, uh, I've got a lot of young people now as clients, yeah. which yeah. I'm really enjoyed about. I'm, I created a quiz the, that is just about to get finished. It is finished. Actually, I just have to put an article to it and we're going to submit it to Huffington Post on trauma and, and love relationships the correlation between parents, mother, father, and how you're with the partners that you bring in now, it's going to be really helpful and it'll end up on the website at some point. And the book is almost finished. Um, it's pretty much finished. I, I, it is on my goal. I'm just sort of waiting for like a manifesting publisher, right? That's what I'm doing. So, but I, but I think you're right. I think it was that core that I needed. Mm -hmm that I needed that piece. You know, you, you, you know, as a healer, you work, you got a, a, can a few cancer clients and you got that on, and then you've got addiction and you get that on, and then you get the children and you get that on. And so it was sort of like, I needed, like you said, all the pieces to come together. Yeah. And you know what? Um, you've come a long way and, and you're doing it. Okay. Um, you know, I get kids all the time, you know, their parents are fighting um, and they feel that they need to fix it and it causes trauma, you know, plus families are coming apart. I mean, you know, even from COVID, there's more and more divorces. One so more. you got your work cut out for you, honey. Yeah. And I love it. I'm so honored to be able to do it. You know, I'm so happy and so grateful that this has happened and has been created. And I, I have to always say thank you, thank you, thank you to you. I, you've always been the person that pushes, even when you're, I'm not even there and you're teaching a class and one of my students are there, you'll say to her, where's your book? So, so you're pushing me even when I'm really not with you. And so I'm very grateful for that. And I've told you that and you know how much I love you and respect you and I'm so grateful. Oh, you my know, it's so always great. my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I hope you all enjoyed today's episode. If so, please link, share, and comment. And be sure to subscribe to our channels so you, you never, ever miss an episode. Thank you so much, Denise. It was such a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much, Anna. I'll talk with you soon.